going, everybody? It is episode 78 here on Hawaii Football Now. Jordan Helly, Hunter Hughes back with you. As always, big mahalo to our sponsor, Spectrum Mobile and Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union. We record this just after 7 a.m. Hawaii time on Wednesday, February 22nd. Uh, sets release this as usually we do on Thursdays every week uh, for the last 77 weeks. Uh, midday or so, uh, that'll be February 23rd. Quick opening drive as we get into things. Final show already of February. We're almost two months into 2023. I still haven't gotten used to 2023 as being like the year. You know, everybody says that every year. I feel like more so this year than any of the previous years. It's it's, it's 2023, huh? Kind of crazy to think about it. So Hawaii spring practices are about halfway through as well. They've got just a couple of weeks before they wrap up things um, and kind of close up shop on the official practice portion. Uh, leading into the summer for all of those uh, capital improvements down there on lower campus as they do continue the work on the Ching complex. All right, quick opening drive here. Uh, It was XFL opening weekend this past weekend. Uh, Saw Cole McDonald score a rushing touchdown for Houston in their win for the win for the Roughnecks. Uh, You got June Jones, who's the offensive coordinator for the Seattle, now Sea Dragons of the third iteration of the XFL. Uh, they suffered a loss to DC, uh, DC quarterback in part. It's kind of a revolving door quarterback, uh, Pearl city high school graduate, Jordan Tahamu, as well as uh, Houston, most recently university of Miami quarterback, De'Eric King, uh, mixing it in as uh, Seattle looked really good in the first half and then kind of fell apart in the second half. Uh, they have Josh Gordon on the team, like that right. Josh Gordon, f- former NFL fame um, in the run and shoot. If we could just get June like a like a like a good quarterback or like a competent quarterback, like he has Ben Denucci, you'll probably remember him. He had a cup of coffee in the NFL. He was at uh, with James Madison or Old Dominion or one of those schools. Um, played pretty good in the first half, threw a couple of picks in the second half, and completely shelled after that. Uh, looked looked uh, thrown off the back foot. Didn't look good. Uh, it was playing with zero confidence. Uh, June's got Josh Gordon on his team. Can we get him just a competent quarterback? I feel like they put up some ridiculous numbers there. Uh, did you watch any of the XFL over the weekend, Hunter? There were a few other Hawaii guys in the mix. I tried to comb through the box scores of the games that I didn't really catch. I, I, I don't. I probably I might have missed somebody out there uh, with University of Hawaii ties. Uh, but I'm going to guess that you were probably glued more towards the uh, the golf this weekend. Definitely a little more on the golf side with Tiger in uh, in the field making the cut. Uh, just the fact that he's playing, uh, was getting made fun of by all my friends that that's the only thing I cared about this weekend, but, uh, my, my good friend Cole McDonald was playing. So of these XFL games, that was definitely the one I had my eye on, um, not just for him, but, um, his former teammate at UH Cedric bird is one of his wide receivers. And so, wanted to see if they would connect on something. It it looked like Cole is kind of uh, the backup at this point or the, Mm -hmm. um, the wildcat um, kind of addition to their offense. They, they kind of would bring him in on short, uh, short distance and, uh, and red zone and ultimately got that kind of read option uh, outside run around touchdown score. Uh, Super cool. Just to see the boys out there doing their thing. Um, also, a couple of these games, like that St. Louis game, Jordan, there's some unique new rules with the XFL kind of put on full display. Like, there's a three-point conversion. Um, the You have the option, instead of kicking an onside kick, to uh, have like a, a fourth and 15 play, and if you convert it, you get the ball back. Um, the refs and umpires, whenever they're up in the booth, like, discussing overturning a a call you can actually hear them they're they're mic'd up which is super interesting because we don't always know what these refs are thinking about or talking about or what tv cameras they're even they even have access to they have access to a whole new super intense camera that we don't get to see and so um it adds kind of uh fun versatility to uh, to the game and uh, I don't think the XFL has ever taken it on the NFL or anything like that but uh, it provides like a nice little I don't know um, 
smorgasbord, you know, of of football to kind of pick and choose from. Yeah, I think some of these things, um, and, and I know that the NFL has sort of a, a, an agreement or partnership with the XFL on some of these experimental rules. I think some of these things are going to catch on. The way that they um, conduct kickoffs where everybody's lined up a lot closer together down the field, I think that's probably the future of the game because it still kind of keeps – the integrity of a, of the kickoff and the big play while um, reducing the the high-speed collisions that kind of come with it. Uh, yeah. The fourth and 15 instead of the onside kick, same thing. I, I, I think that's probably in the future. I, some of these things I think will carry over to the NFL. Uh, and I think that, you know, not only is it a developmental league for players, uh, for potential guys to get into the NFL, but a uh, big thing is the rules. Uh, and so I think watching it, I, I do think there's a lot of potential for uh, some of these rules, you know, maybe not the extra points. Uh, it's kind of cool that, you know, nobody kicks an extra point. You either go for one, two or three, uh, as you pointed out. But I, I do think some of the especially in the kicking game. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. That's that's the future of the game. I mean, that's what uh, the miners do in baseball. Um, they experiment with technology. They experiment with rules. Uh, a lot of what we're uh, seeing in Major League Baseball with uh, runner on second in extra innings, that kind of ghost runner situation was pioneered in the minors. And so they they see how it works down there. Uh, they're, they're even thinking about electronic balls and strikes now. Um, maybe the XFL is one of those testing points for rule changes, um, different things like that. And it will ultimately help the NFL in the long run. Yeah, I, I think so too, right? Pitch clock, uh, one of those as well That's that right. uh, they tested out in the minor leagues. Now it's now it's a thing, um, and it's it's kind of becoming the norm. Uh, banning the shift, all that kind of stuff in baseball. So yeah, I think we'll see a lot of that in football as well. All right, before we head into the game time, I want to remind you that Hawaii football now is brought to you by Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union. Originally opened in 1936 as a credit union for educators, Hawaii USA has inspired a culture of giving that is rooted in education and has since become Hawaii's largest credit union and expanded to other areas of community need that impact financial health, including health care, housing, and hunger. To learn more, please visit HawaiiUSAFCU.com. All right, game time here. First half on episode 78 of Hawaii Football. Now, uh, the AD search is underway. We got official word as to when you got to get your resume in. Uh, if you maybe meet the minimum qualifications, March 10th, by the way, uh, a couple of weeks coming up. Uh, if you want to get that in, we found out uh, who is on David Lassner's seven-person search committee. Uh, we'll get into that as well, uh, who they should be targeting, who maybe the job description is favored to target. Uh, and we'll get into that here in just a sec. Before we get to that, Hunter, uh, I know you've been out at practices here and there. Um, any new observations for you from down on the practice fields over the last week since we last spoke before we uh, head into uh, the AD discussion. Yeah. Um, we're in week three now of spring ball. And that's kind of the, uh, the marking point of guys kind of hitting a wall, hitting a lull in spring practice. It's a long uh, process. It is a long process, man. And you got to remember these are, these are college students. They're they're kids in a lot of ways. Um, getting them up every morning, you know, some of them before 5 a.m. if they have to drive from different parts of the island and, uh, you know, come in and get some good work in on the field is not all that easy to do. And the, the challenge at spring ball, and I, I think Coach Timmy and the, the staff is reaching that point right now, is how do we cultivate a competitive environment while keeping everybody safe? Because you're going against your own guys day in and day out right now. We, we don't see our first opponent for another seven months. So the, the challenge um, is, you know, how do we keep these guys interested? How do we keep engagement up? And um, so my observation in the last couple of days is just uh, that they're needing kind of a juggernaut. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some sort of, um, um, I don't know, not a publicity stunt or just something fun come from the football team uh, maybe soon on some of their social media platforms because it looked like they needed kind of a, a jolt, in my opinion. Um, and uh, yeah, some of the, the wide receivers and running backs were kind of 
just not as sharp as what they were in the first couple of weeks that I noticed. And there was a lot of excitement over the run and shoot. And it just, uh, um, it looked like defense had their, uh, ate them for breakfast yesterday. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a grind for sure. Uh, and, and really when you get down to it, it's, uh, it's a long process. So yeah, you, you gotta find ways to spice things up. Right. So we'll see, we'll see how that looks, uh, getting some good reports on the quarterback play um the progress you know of implementing the offense it's always such a balancing act man when you when you don't have a game to look forward to at the end of the at the end of the road right at least during fall camp it's like all right we're gearing up for a game <laughs> we're gearing up oh, for game week zero they 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 forewent the possibility of a of a spring game or an island day kind of deal this year as well logistically it just kind of didn't work out with the calendar um the way that uh the improvements needed to get going uh, at the end of everything so yeah it's it's always a little tough um but uh these coaches they've they've gone through it <laughs> they know what that's like through the spring and uh yeah looking looking for uh, a positive i guess second half if you will of spring practices yeah definitely and you know it's it's encouraging to see coach timmy working so closely with the quarterbacks uh that was one thing as a former player in the run and shoot that i wish that rollo would have taken a little bit more hands-on approach with us in teaching this very niche uh, offense um, kind of, you know, a more hands-on approach with us. Cause we, we were kind of thrown in and not, not really knowing what to do and, and how to do it. And uh, Timmy is with the quarterbacks in just about every single period at practice. And, you know, for the top three um, Shager, Joey Yellen and uh, Jake Farrell, their footwork and their eyes are really starting to uh, match up with timing and flow at a point that I I would expect to see from a uh, a starter. And so um, they're they're starting to get it, and they're they're adding a little bit of creativity in there where they can. Um, and I think all of that has to do with Timmy just having a real hands-on active approach with the, uh, the quarterback crew. That's, um, that's encouraging. I think, I think when, um, you're putting in an offense, as you said, that, uh, somebody on staff has played in at that position, it helps, it helps to kind of learn through their eyes. So we'll see how everything works out. Uh, of course the football program getting ready for another season, the future of the football program is obviously of vital importance uh, for the for the athletic department as a whole. And the athletic yeah. department as a whole is going to be under new leadership, right, by the time football season rolls around. And so the athletic director search is underway here at the University of Hawaii. Uh, the job has officially been posted. Uh, we learned about a week ago um, some of the parameters uh, application materials should be submitted by March 10th, 2023. So if you happen to be listening to this podcast and you're like, Hey, I want to be the athletic director. Um, go ahead, check it out. Um, there you're are, applying, uh, sorry, go ahead. I asked if you're applying. Uh, I don't think I meet the qualifications. Um, yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll get into that here in just a second. So ultimately the decision is going to come down to university of Hawaii president, David Lassner. Uh, he's appointed a seven-person search committee to assist in the search. This is all per a press release put out by the University of Hawaii. Uh, the committee is co-chaired by UH Manoa Provost Michael Bruno and President COO of the companies of AIO, Susan Eicher. So those are the two co-chairs. The other five members of the search committee are Laura Beeman, head women's basketball coach, obviously, at the University of Hawaii, Charlie Wade, men's volleyball coach, uh, at the University of Hawaii and uh, two-time reigning national champion. Uh, you've got uh, Albert Chi, uh, Vice President of Retail and Marketing uh, and communicate, Community Relations for Island Energy. And he's the former chair of the Ahahui Koa Anui Nui, right? The fundraising arm for University of Hawaii Athletics <clears throat> as a separate nonprofit. A lot of folks familiar with uh, Koa Anui Nui. Uh, you've got Sabrina McKenna, who's a Hawaii Supreme Court Associate Justice and former Wahine basketball player. So you got a former player um, on the committee, as well as Scott Sinnott, the UH Manoa faculty athletics representative and professor of psychology 
at UH Manoa. And then facilitating the search as an ex officio member of the committee is Deborah Ishii. Uh, she's uh, part of the UH Manoa Search Advisory Committee support staff there. Um, search committees always, you know, sometimes search firms are hired. You go and pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to an outside entity to go find somebody. Um, the, the, this is a little more in-house for the University of Hawaii here. You've got the business sector uh, represented. You've got college administration re represented. You've got college faculty represented. Uh, you've got an alum uh, uh, here, as well as a couple of current coaches, which is always kind of interesting. Um, the one thing that I will point out, especially from our podcast's angle, uh, nobody with a direct football background as part of this staff. Uh, and obviously, you know, it's not all about football. Charlie Wade's won two national championships. Hard to argue there. Uh, Laura Beeman has done a terrific job during her time. Um, and is very well established and very well respected uh, in the collegiate basketball game. Not trying to argue there or anything, um, but from we're we're a little we're a little biased in how we analyze things here on the podcast. It's white football now, um, and so nobody with a direct it, it, look. Ouchie has been a big part of the fundraising efforts and whatnot, and that that obviously encompasses football. But it's such a big part of the puzzle. Football is right the the direction of the program, the viability of the program, the unsettling yeah. conference landscape. And we'll get into that uh, a little bit later on in depth as well. Um, uh, we can get into some of these comments from David Lassner as well. But just, um, you know, I think at least having football in mind, and I'm not saying that these seven members of the search committee can't have a good grasp on on football or, or the importance of football when it comes to the overall equation of of creating a financially stable and successful athletic department. Um, but uh, your thoughts on, on not having, you know, somebody with that kind of background uh, as part of this search committee. Yeah, it's good perspective, Jordan. I, the only thing is UH football in its most recent history has the highest turnover rate really of any other sport at, at UH um, you get coaches like Laura Beeman and Charlie Wade who have been there for a while now. They might have a better sense of from, you know, the institutional level, what is going to be good for all of University of Hawaii athletics. Um, I, I agree. Like, couldn't we have found maybe somebody uh, with experience or, you know, still in the community that has a good uh, you know, ear to the floor of, you know, the, the pulse of how all of this works. Um, but uh, at least with our current coaching staff, no one's been there all that long, other than some of our support staff coaches. Um, so, you know, Timmy's only been here for a year and change. Um, obviously, he was here as a, a player as well, but I, I wonder who in the community if even if you had someone in mind uh that would have been good for consideration uh to get like some football perspective in there yeah i i think you know whether that would have been an alum or, or somebody like that right there are obviously a lot of successful um football alums as well and, and hard to argue with sabrina mckenna um former University of Hawaii athlete who's now, you know, a Supreme Court Associate Justice. Like, that's a pretty big deal uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, per the release, David Lassner saying, quote, UH needs a leader who can advance the athletic success of our 21 intercollegiate sports. At the same time, we maximize the academic success of our 450 student athletes and ensure their physical and mental health and wellness. The successful candidate will display impeccable integrity in their work and the creativity to ensure the financial stability of the country's most isolated Division One athletics program. Our next athletics director might must have the insight and agility to lead through the most dynamic and challenging period in the history of NCAA intercollegiate athletics. Uh, he went on to say in the release, quote, we appreciate the amazing community support for UH Manoa Athletics and know there is wide interest in the position. We look forward to selecting a superb athletics director who will advance our Rainbow Wahine and Warrior programs for the entire state. And so it's kind of interesting because he acknowledges, right? 
in the release, uh, the financial sustainability, ensuring the financial sustainability of the country's most isolated Division One athletics program, um, the most dynamic and challenging period in the history of NCAA intercollegiate athletics, the ever-evolving conference landscape, NIL, everything in between that comes with that. That's a big part of the job. Like, that is, to me, the most important part. Yes, obviously, I think it goes without saying that you want the teams to perform well academically. You want them to conduct themselves with integrity. You want to avoid, you know, scandal. You want to you want to make sure that uh, everything is on the up and up. Um, you know, it's, especially with college basketball, we keep hearing of all these stories of gun-related incidents and all kinds of things. Man, um, you know, knock on wood, thankfully, Hawaii's, um, for the most part, staying out of the news in, in that realm. Like, that that's sort of a given. And I'm not saying it should be taken for granted, but it's kind of a given, right? Where it's an academic institution, you want to perform well academically. That that should be a given uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, but at the end of the day, you can't continue to support 21 intercollegiate athletic sports. Uh, you can't continue to support 450 student athletes if the program isn't financially sustainable. And yeah. how do you go about doing that? And you can't have success on the field either. If the program or the field, the court, the pool, whatever, um, if the program or the athletic department isn't financially sustainable. And I think a lot of that circles back to football, right? It it It's a big part of the equation. It's a huge part of the pie, a uh, huge slice of the pie when it comes down to things. And so I think you need somebody who is very, very creative, somebody who's going to think outside the box. Um, whether that person exists already in the athletic department or within the University of Hawaii system or out of it. My thing is cast the widest net possible, look at all of the candidates, and then find the best person for the job. Yeah, I, I almost wonder with some of the prerequisites or um, um, qualifications, if they don't have someone in mind in-house um, just because there were there were a couple things uh, l- lower on the list, uh, I I haven't looked at the list in a little while, but uh, something along the lines of any number of these qualifications or combination uh, for the right person will be considered. So there was almost this this feeling whenever I was reading it of we. Um, we've got a few people in mind for this already. And I, I almost wonder, would it, you know, I'll pose this question to you, Jordan, would you be okay if we hired someone uh, without any Hawaii ties? You know, if someone was an amazing athletic director from say San Diego or LA and had an understanding of the corporatization of college athletics and some of the challenges that we face right now with the the new stadium project the the risk of being demoted from division one status with football um uh a, a number of other pressing issues that are kind of at hand right now um i almost wonder if we try to go look for a big dog you know what i mean yeah, it's kind of interesting because uh, others have pointed out, but but Stephen Sai had a really, uh, I thought, good column in yesterday's Honolulu Star Advertiser, uh, yesterday being Tuesday, uh, February 21st, if you want to go check that out. Uh, but pointing out and making the point that uh, part of the job qualifications listed in the job description is three years of collegiate athletics administrative experience. And so that's pretty specific, right? And, and, and some would argue that it's, geared towards targeting somebody in-house and the point is not to say that anybody within the athletic department or within the university of Hawaii system already isn't the best candidate for the job but the only way to know that is to expand the search beyond right the only way to know if you've got the best person in-house is to conduct as thorough a search as possible and maybe that leads you back to somebody already on staff or somebody within the program or somebody you know whether that's a coach or an administrator or somebody, right? You don't know. Um, But the only way to do that is to really expand things. And 
I've heard some people who have read through the thing a little bit closer, right? Because there's some there's some fine print and whatnot. That, that maybe there are some loopholes in there, and maybe loopholes aren't the right word. Um, that sounds a little, you know, not on the up and up. Uh, but there maybe are ways to to look beyond just the the three years of collegiate ath- athletics administrative experience. Because as Stephen Sy points out, it was quite the list. I love Stephen. Uh, he he listed like Oprah wouldn't qualify, Mark Cuban wouldn't qualify, Jerry West, uh, Peter Ho. He listed in there. Uh, Josh Green uh, was listed in there. The governor, uh, Pat Riley was Elon listed Musk. in there like so all of these very very successful people right in different arenas of uh professional life uh wouldn't technically qualify because they don't have three years of collegiate athletics administrative experience and so i i hope that isn't limiting i hope that is maybe guiding and like hey yeah you probably want somebody that's got a little bit of administrative experience i don't necessarily feel that it has to come at the collegiate level uh, that could come in the profession, that could come in the business sector, that could come in professional sports, as you point out, right? If you want to go after some big fish who maybe wants to come back home um, or something like that. Yeah, that could be. And so I I think that it probably should be somebody that has a decent knowledge of Hawaii, you know, uh, to, to answer your question, Hunter, and, and not trying to dodge that or anything. I do think it should be somebody that has a fairly strong understanding. And this is a very similar point I think we've made when talking about the football coach in that position, because it's very similar to me uh, because of how profile, high high profile it is. And and even more so as the athletics director, because you're really dealing with the business side of things. Um, And you do a little bit of that as the football coach, but you really have to understand the limitations that come with the job, the challenges that come with the job existing in the University of Hawaii. It is a publicly, it is a public position. It is a publicly paid position as the athletics director at the University of Hawaii. You are subject to all kinds of things that come with the bureaucratic red tape that has, um, you know, ensnarled things in Hawaii for forever uh, when it comes to getting facilities built, when it comes to fundraising, when it comes to fixing light bulbs, uh, when it comes to everything in between, uh, dealing with the legislature, dealing with powerful players in the business sector in Hawaii, dealing with powerful players in the political arena in Hawaii, like that is all probably that's more important to me than three years of collegiate athletics administrative totally, experience. Totally. It, I almost want like a a lobbying tough lawyer up there that that can work deals out you know um but you know deals we need deals we need deals man um it it, it's also one of those things though where i think the community in hawaii wants to at least think of the athletic director as someone who would be kind and uh almost like another mayor kind of a a situation that you know you could go up and talk to him he's very kind he looks good in an aloha shirt he's just kind of over on the side make sure everything runs smooth i don't know if i necessarily need that out of my athletic director like as long as he's getting stuff done and the the teams have what they need it's kind of like a faceless job it really is like I like to know who he is, but it's even whenever uh, Dave would come to practice and stuff and Dave's a great guy. It was kind of like, Oh, there he is. Hi. That was it. You know what I mean? It's kind of a unique, um, almost big brother up there. And I want my big brother to be tough. Yeah. It's gotta be somebody, right? Whoever it is. Uh, he or she, once they get the job, like it is such a monumental task. You got to hit the ground running, right? You got to be able to hit the ground running. And so just having that, that knowledge, that institutional knowledge of how things work, how things don't work, <clears throat> you know, um, I think is, is so important. Uh, and that to me would be as high on my list of priorities, um, And I don't know how you necessarily quantify that in terms of a job description and listing like, you know, minimum qualifications. It's like, know how um, screwed up everything is here and uh, be able to navigate that. 
Uh, maybe that's more part of the interview process. I always think back to Ben Jay when he got hired, right? Came from a huge athletics program at Ohio State. Um, very smart guy as well. Um, I think fairly, you know, agreeable guy, you know, an easy guy to get along with. Uh, and he's done good things since he's left the University of Hawaii. But uh, when he came in, right, he said, uh, you know, we're, we're going to fix the light bulbs uh, in the office. And it's like, no, no, no. It doesn't just work like that. You can't just like walk in there and fix the light bulbs because that's a that's a union job that belongs to a union worker. And if you start taking away union work, you're going to have an issue with the unions. Um, and and we don't, that's that's not something you want to delve into because then you got grievances and you got things that hold things up. Like changing light bulbs just isn't that simple, you know. Like it's hey hey, and 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 that's that's maybe a little bit of an exaggeration on everything, but just just like that, right? Just just like understanding, like, like all right, you can't just go ahead and start doing things yourself. Like you got to make sure that it's it's cleared by the uh, the the proper channels and all these kinds of things. Like just just that kind of stuff, you know um need someone just, who can just, play ball yeah yeah you know it's 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 probably some of those things you, like most people at home are just like what what are you talking about but um that's that's kind of just how things exist right uh whether it was fixing light bulbs getting more soap in the showers whatever it was um it's just it's never as simple as you think it is uh and having somebody who just knows that already or understands that already I think will be a big, big deal. And then the other thing, um, I think there are a lot of positive things about the University of Hawaii Athletic Department. The uh, the graduation rate, uh, the grade performance is really good. It really is across the board in a lot of the sports. Uh, and I don't think that should be glossed over. Uh, it, it's been very good. Um, you know, there, there have been obviously a lot of successful programs. Men's and women's volleyball uh, continue to be top notch obviously back-to-back -back national championships on the men's side. Some of the other sports, right? Swim and dive, water polo, um, continually battling for conference championships. Uh, swim and dive just won the MPSF over the weekend. Uh, women's water polo consistently in the top 10 in the country uh, and are once again this season, right? There are a lot of good things about the Hawaii Athletic Department. Men's and women's basketball, again, uh, you know, challenging for conference championships, big road sweep for the for the basketball bows this weekend up on the continent. Um, but I think there is room and I think there is a want from the community for examining the status quo, right? When it comes to how people consume the program, to how the programs are marketed, to media rights, to conference affiliation, to, you know, kind of everything, right? And, and with a new athletic director comes a new vision, comes a new way of doing things, perhaps, or not, right? Maybe not. Maybe it's somebody who wants to just continue everything David Matlin is doing. Uh, maybe that's how David Lastner sees fit as to how the program should be run. Uh, but this does provide an opportunity, I think, to really examine how the program goes about doing things with the athletics department and the university of Hawaii goes about doing things um, and, and being creative, perhaps thinking outside the box. Uh, and I, and I hope that is on the tape. Yeah. I, you've mentioned it a few times, Jordan. I think you're exactly right. The, the ability to think outside the box, I think goes hand in hand with any, big time job here in Hawaii that we have certain limitations and uh, um, certain misfortunes that other places just don't have to deal with. It takes us 10 years to build anything out here. It takes us a certain length of time to get everybody on board and bought in. And you really have to get creative and, you know, for those who want to say things about, you know, David Matlin, the dude got it done for the new, you know, chin complex for us. And yeah, it's a work in progress, but we were without any option whenever they deemed uh, Aloha Stadium uh, unfit to host games any longer. And he got that done fast. Um, something that we usually don't see out here very often. And 
I, I want to kind of tip my cap to that and whoever they find next. And, you know, they're going to hopefully have kind of an overlapping period where uh, Mr. Matlin kind of walks side by side and kind of holds their hand into this, into this job. I, I hope that that is one of those traits that carries over because we need to kind of jump on some of these issues. Yeah. Um, it, it, that I think is one of the, uh, big feathers in the cap of David Matlin is, is how quickly he was able to get a lot of that done. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, coach hirings, that's going to be a big part of it. Um, angling within the conference, that's going to be a big part of it. And we'll talk a bit about that, uh, as we are a little overdue for, uh, our halftime pause here. Uh, so we'll pause that. We'll get into a little bit more of the discussion, uh, when we return, uh, you're listening to episode seven, eight, Hawaii football now. This is Hawaii Football Now from ESPN Honolulu. All right, second half time, Hawaii Football Now, episode 70. Jordan Hunter back with you. And Hunter, we were talking about the uh, athletics director search, what that's going to look like. Uh, this will be an ongoing conversation, obviously, as we learn more about, you know, potential candidates. Uh, folks may be interested in the job. Uh, I don't think anybody's really come out and said publicly, like, yeah, I'm going after it uh just yet and, and we do have a, a couple more weeks obviously we mentioned march 10th before um they will close the application process and then they get into the decision making process right get people in for interviews have this search committee discuss what's going on um a, a huge task for the new athletic director is finding a stable footing uh for the football program i think one of the uh the really nice things about the last round of conference shuffling that that really impacted hawaii um, you know, boy, it's been over 10 years now, was finding a home uh, as the wax sort of disintegrated, right? And, and not only finding a football home, but it really, I think, solid footing for the non-football programs uh, in the Big West, right? The majority of the athletic department's uh, sports are housed in the Big West Conference. Uh, that is a, a very, very stable conference. Um <clears throat> And a good home there. And then obviously the likes of, of swim and dive in the MPSF. And there's, there's a couple of other sports out there that, that um, aren't under the big West umbrella, uh, but for football, right. It was getting into the mountain West. That was a big deal. Uh, it cost the university of Hawaii, just like it does in the big West. We pay travel subsidies. It's not ideal, um, but it did provide a lot of stability <laughs> for the athletics department. Um, it's looking like, inevitable i think within the next couple of years that the university of hawaii will need to to dance again with somebody um because uh, as the pac-12 the big 12 expansion buzz kind of continues on um john canzano reporting that uh you know san diego state and smu rumored to be the top priorities for the pac-12 and obviously one of those schools resides in the mountain west it seems inevitable and, and we've talked about this a little bit and and it's kind of being dragged out, but San Diego State seem, seems like a done deal at some point, uh, leaving for the Pac-12. Uh, per Gonzano, some discussions um, with Fresno State and the Big 12, uh, excuse me, and the Pac-12, kind of lukewarm discussions. It sounds like the Big 12 uh, having more serious discussions with Fresno Gonzano, termed it uh, professional discussions with Fresno State. I think it's more likely they probably end up in the Big 12, uh, the Pac-12, quote, keeping Boise State at arm's length. The Big 12 also targeting Boise. Um, we've heard uh, Colorado State, Air Force, some of those other schools in the mountain time zone, you know, kind of being targets of the Big 12 as well, especially as things sort of unfold, right? Uh, they obviously add the four new schools in Houston, uh, UCF, Cincinnati, and uh, who else they added in there? Uh, one of the other Texas schools, I think, at this point with the departure of Texas and Oklahoma. Um, so it it ranges, right, from, I think, pretty guarantees that San Diego State is leaving to fairly likely that Fresno State and Boise State are looking to level up, if you will, to, to maybe in a Colorado State or an Air Force, right? We know Colorado State has invested a lot of money in their facilities uh, an athletic program as a whole. Uh, I think a fairly attractive school, eh, somewhat close to a big market, but but in the mountain time zone, they kind of bridges some things for for either the Pac-12 or the Big 12, probably more likely the Big 12. And so that's, you know, you start 
checking off teams in the 12-member conference like that. You're going to be down to to eight teams here pretty soon. It's going to look like what the WAC was uh, before everybody looked for a lifeline um, in the Mountain West. And so this is going to be a huge task for the athletic director to deal with, a monumental task for the athletic director to deal with. What was it, Jim Donovan, who was on uh, in charge when uh, Hawaii found the landing spots in the Mountain West and the um, and the Big West for everybody else. And so. Hunter, I don't, I don't know if you've got some thoughts on some of this news and it, it not anything groundbreaking or um, uh, a new, maybe other than the PAC 12 kind of zeroing in on SMU, but that, you know, that, that'll obviously dominoes will affect Hawaii, but isn't directly affecting the mountain West at this point. So um, I think inevitably in sooner rather than later, uh, Hawaii is going to have to figure some things out. Yeah. You know, I can't help whenever you go through, uh, that kind of list of news, Jordan, to play the what if game and what um, what could have been. Let's just uh, go there for a second, because uh, when I look at UH for the past, you know, 15, 20 years at what we experienced, um, when did uh, Matlin come in? He came in uh, after Chow was hired. Do, do you remember what year that was? Uh, yeah, he didn't hire. He didn't hire Chow. Okay. Um, and I think one of his big decisions was letting Chow go, oh. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. That was one of his first big ones, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. the The only reason I'm I'm going back there just for our sake is June leaves some of the the most amazing years that we've ever had at University of Hawaii. We bring Coach Mack in, kind of retains a lot of that same staff and a lot of the same pieces, and we're successful for a couple of years. I believe we even had a conference uh, championship during that time, which is still our last one. I, I, mm-hmm. I, like to, I might add. Um, and then started this process of every four or five years, we get a new head coach and we're trying to break that mold prayerfully with Timmy right now. You look at, some of the discussions being had with Fresno and even Boise with conferences like the big 12 and the, the, the belief in a lot of uh, our friends discussions in the media is that it would never work for Hawaii to land in one of those big conferences. Well, look at where Fresno was all those years ago. They weren't in a position like they are now. Um, Boise was kind of just beginning their climb too, you know, back in that um, that time frame as well. And we're in a new era now of thinking of these conferences not so much as geographical, you know, connections, but uh, hey, who who wants to come and be a part of our conference? The the Big Ten is stretching all the way to the West Coast with the addition of USC and UCLA now. If we're looking at Big 12, talking to schools like Fre- um, Fresno and Boise, they're expanding to the coast right now as well. Um, and so I can't help but wonder, had we handled that time frame a little bit better in the the MAC um, transition into you know the, the future, had we remained more competitive through that time frame maybe perhaps we would have been a target in a very timely um time frame that we're in right now or a timely era where these conferences like the Pac-12 and the Big 12 are having to think outside the box to remain relevant with the SECs and the Big 10s and the ACCs so Again, it's a little bit, you know, of a tripped out thought right there, but I can't help but think, why can't we compete with Fresno at that level? Um, Had we, you know, been a powerhouse and won four or five conference championships in the last, you know, 10 years, I think, I really do, that the Pac-12 would consider us in a different capacity. And then all of the other stuff comes with that too. You know, we would need to have fixed Aloha Stadium probably earlier in the time frame conference championships and bull appearances and big time bull wins comes with money as well. Um, all of those things, it would have been on the up and up. Uh, it, it brings up a whole other mess of questions, but I don't know. I can't help but play the, uh, the, the what if game here, Jordan. 
Yeah, look, there were a lot of uh, missteps yeah. <laughs> along the way. You know, mismanagement, uh, people lost their jobs. It was messy. Uh, yeah, and, and so it it was, as you pointed out, right, the, the two conference championships in a four-season span, right, obviously sharing it in 2010. Um, the notoriety of the of the the Sugar Bowl season, Colt Brennan, uh, what a what a national star he was, um, making it to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. Um, that was the peak of things, right? And and as you pointed out, presented an opportunity to kind of catapult not just the football program but the athletic department forward, uh, mm-hmm. and but it also coincided with, uh, you know, the reluctance by administration at the time to kind of continue playing ball with June Jones. Um, it was also the time that, uh, you know, Colt and the guys pointed out that uh, they didn't have soap in the locker rooms. Like that was the, that was the same time. Right. And, and kind of showed the underbelly and, and some of the shortcomings of the athletic department um that was somehow terrible at that time terrible yeah that that is somehow um you know playing in the sugar bowl at that time against the the georgia team that you know had i don't know how much money invested in the program at that time but uh, millions and millions of dollars and that's only increased uh exponentially since uh over the last 15 17 years or so and so i I think you're right it was a, a tremendous opportunity um, and it would have taken some creative thinking. It would have taken some risk taking, I think, yep. uh, to really kind of lean into it and really take that leap. Um, but yeah, they they missed the ball, right? Like it, it uh, yeah. <laughs> things didn't quite work out. Uh, and Greg McMackin, who we, uh, you know, had an opportunity to remember uh, yeah. in in uh, what was it last week's show or, or two weeks ago now. Um, you know, uh, it was a little over 500. I uh, had a couple of really solid seasons, had a couple of uh, six and seven seasons, and uh, and then was let go. <laughs> and uh, things nosedived after that. Uh, attendance went significantly down uh, and has yet to recover uh, really after that. And it's not to say that the attendance prior uh, was always sellouts, right? I think June only sold out a low stadium like three or four times. It was like you could count it on one hand. Uh, in his tenure, you know, that's 50,000 seats. Look, they, they, they were getting north of 25,000 quite often. Uh, now 25,000 would be a pipe dream. Um, and I get it, obviously, this, the constraints of, of Ching, but it, when Rolo was doing really well, uh, they weren't they weren't packing the place. Uh, oh. And so it is it is it coincided with a lot of things, I think, and and uh, created apathy amongst fans, I think, created some frustration uh, being behind the pay-per-view um, paywall when it came to watching home games, just everything, you know, I, I think a confluence of events and obviously the the lack of success under Norm uh, didn't help. And, um, you know, obviously Norm takes over, they jump into the Mountain West immediately, right? And, and so that was his first year, uh, which was always going to be a difficult uh, transition uh, and one that didn't go well. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm with you. There, there, there were opportunities um Kauai did not take advantage of those opportunities schools like Boise uh Fresno uh even some of the others in conference Colorado State um you know some of the other schools that that, that jumped over from the WAC like Nevada like Boise uh kind of just zoomed on by uh in a way it was sort of stuck in the mud spinning its wheels and and unfortunately we are where we are uh and I think that's why you know as uh not to bag on on David Matlin or anything like that uh, we've talked about some of the successes he's had. This prevents the opportunity to press the reset button. Uh, and I hope that they press it or at least find somebody that is willing to explore different ways of doing things um, to take this program uh, to a different level. Uh, it's, like the hope, old N64. it's like the old N64, Jordan. You got to lift it up and blow on it. and Blow out the cartridge, yeah. That's right. <laughs> For our listeners, maybe uh, that was a little after your time. That was definitely me and Jordan's childhood. Yeah, that was uh, that was the good old days, man. 
Uh, and it worked. It always works. Worked, just blow the dust out of the cartridge and uh, the game and start right back up. So, uh, and you, you'd be on your way, whether it was GoldenEye or uh, Mario Kart or whatever it was. Star, um, or, uh, Star Fox. Yeah. <laughs> Some Smash Bros. Um, yeah, that was that was always that was always the good stuff. All right. Uh, fun conversation, as always. Um, we uh, we do want to thank the guys dropping us some lines on the comments as well. Uh, our guy, uh, Al. Matthew V, uh, mentioning, uh, sending his shout out to Coach Mac, Coach Mac as well. Um, appreciate that from, from Matt. Uh, our guy, Al from VA, as always, uh, dropping us a line, talking about the run and shoot, uh, saying, uh, you know, he brought uh, Coach June Jones and Coach uh, Kenny Neal Matalolo around, uh, helping uh, bring things, uh, you know, up to speed. Uh, June's Coach busy. Jones? Yeah, June's he's got busy. a job right now. Uh, he's busy coaching in the XFL. Uh, Coach Kenny, not really his offensive forte uh, when it comes to the triple option versus the run and shoot. Uh, but uh, something we'll get into, especially uh, as we kind of get out of spring, uh, I, our understanding is that, you know, Timmy and uh, some of the coaches are – planning some some learning opportunities with with different guys elsewhere as well because they got a little extended time right between the end of spring practice yeah. and the start of summer so uh something we'll get into there <clears throat> so good I'd stuff like as always. Something yeah go quick, ahead just about june um for for those listening uh we've had some discussions uh on on the radio as well i don't think june's a real big fan of uh right now just personally yeah, yeah, there there was the whole um, you know, hiring fiasco thing amongst oh, that was others. A nightmare last year. The way that they dragged him through the mud, that was pathetic. Yeah. So that um N- not that he's not a big fan of Timmy. I think that there's always a love. No, no, there's a relationship there for sure. Yeah, there, yeah. there's always a love for former players and even back in Rolo's time, he would pick up the phone and they would they would talk about stuff and all these guys have their old playbooks. Um, not to mention, I'm sure they're privy to even some of June's personal stuff from, you know, the the annals of the run and shoot. Uh, it, it's a, a passed down tradition, you know, um, but uh, he the, the, it, everything that happened well, last year, I, I don't think he wants to anything to do with with UH right now for the perceive the perceivable future, because, man, they. They did not handle that situation well, and I'm I'm speaking more from the um, administrative level at University of Hawaii and how they handled Coach Jones. That was that 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 was not good. Yeah, I think uh, I think he's very willing to help Timmy, the person, the coach. I think he's very willing to help his guys, um, but understandably so. I don't know if he's quite as willing to help the university. At this point, um, and he's done you never know. Let, let the man do his thing. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's he's coaching professionals again, man. That's that's pretty cool stuff. And uh, get him a better quarterback. Sorry, Ben DiNucci. I just I watched the second half, and it was it wasn't good. They have Josh Gordon on the team. Uh, the dude can Give still Mo go a get call. It. Give Mo a call, man. Yeah, go up yeah. There. Somebody can just somebody that can go out there and spin it, man. That's yeah. that's that's all we need. All right, uh, quick two-minute drill over time to get out of here. Uh, again, reminding everybody, this Saturday is the Aloha to Aloha Stadium uh, event over at Aloha Stadium. Uh, saying goodbye to the uh, to the old facility. ESPN Honolulu will be part of it. Uh, they'll be down uh, near the stage area. They've got a tent set up. You can go uh, check that out. All kinds of cool stuff. Old memorabilia, um, the Hawaii Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, there will be entertainment throughout. Uh, some of the uh, Rainbow Warrior coaching staff will be down there as well. Um, it's You can go on to the Eventbrite. Uh, if you go to the Aloha Stadium website, every, all the information is there. So just want to remind everybody, uh, in case it wasn't on your radar, in case you maybe missed last week's episode, um, go check that out. It'll be a pretty cool event. It runs like all day. It goes from like 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, entertainment, um, meet and greets, um, all kinds of old memories, memorabilia uh, from everything, you know, obviously beyond just football uh, that took place in that uh, iconic, iconic venue. Um, and and if you see any of the ESPN whole little guys, go ahead and uh, say hello uh, down there. Maybe we'll send Hunter as uh, as a representative here from the podcast. Uh, so anything else you want to add in, Hunter, before we get out of here? 
Hmm. Uh, just that, uh, hmm. I think I'm good, Jordan, actually. There we go. That yeah. that's that that is more than okay. We have uh we have gone for like an hour here uh talking about the future of the program. So if uh you know if anybody at UH needs any great ideas thrown their way, just give us a call. Maybe give the podcast a listen. Uh I say in jest. Um but uh thanks, thanks as always uh to everybody for tuning in. Thanks as always to our sponsor, Spectrum Mobile and Hawaii USA FCU as well. Big thanks to our guy Jonathan on the controls. Uh, keeping this thing going and uh, basically saving us from ourselves. And uh, big thanks to you as well, as always, Hunter. We'll see you next week on Hawaii Football Now, right here on the ESPN Honolulu family of networks. You've been listening to Hawaii Football Now with Jordan Halley and Hunter Hughes, all from ESPN Honolulu.